Hey everyone, and welcome to the second lesson of our day trading series. This one is on volume analysis. This is one of my favorite topics in all of trading, so really excited to share it with you guys. I think it's really going to open your eyes when you're looking at charts and trying to interpret price action like we talked about in the previous lesson. All right, so before we hop into it, I'm just going to quickly go over the outline for today's lesson. First, we're going to talk about volume and just how you interpret on your chart. We're going to briefly discuss why it matters to us as traders at a very high level. And then we're going to get into some really detailed analysis, revisiting those single candle types that we talked about on the previous lesson and the four C's of price action. But this time we're going to layer volume in and make all of that analysis tremendously more powerful. Then we're going to end the lesson by revisiting support and resistance and again viewing that concept through the lens of volume. So with that, let's get started. So to begin today's course, I'm just going to quickly cover the absolute basics of volume. Volume is just the total number of shares that have been traded during a specific time frame. When you're looking at a candlestick chart, such as this 15-minute chart of Alibaba, the volume bars at the bottom cover the same time frame as their corresponding candle directly above them. So this is a 15-minute chart, so this volume bar represents 15 minutes of volume, and as you can see, there have been about 1.7 million shares transacted during this 15-minute time frame. Last thing I'll note real fast, just because it sometimes confuses people, is that these volume bars at the bottom are normally colored the same as their corresponding candle above. So if you have a red down candle, your volume bar for that time frame will also be colored red. This really doesn't matter at all, other than just making it easy to visually read and to follow up and down so that you understand which bar corresponds to which candle. So with that, let's get into some more detailed topics. Okay, so now that we have some of that intro stuff out of the way, let's get into why volume is so critically important to traders. For me, it really comes down to these two concepts, and I want to try to hammer these home as much as possible throughout the rest of this lesson. The first is that volume equals effort. This is the most foundational concept in the study of volume, and is critically important to your price action interpretation. If you have a large price move, you should really generally require a large volume of shares to have been transacted for that move to take place, and same for smaller moves in reverse. When the market's effort is not in line with the resulting price move, this is going to be referred to as a volume anomaly, and that's a concept that we'll hit on a lot in future slides. In general, for concept one, you should really start to think of volume as the validation criteria for a specific candle or a specific candlestick pattern. The second concept that we'll talk about is that volume reveals the big players in the marketplace. Volume is one of the few tools that traders have to identify when larger participants have stepped into the market, because at the end of the day, there aren't many ways that big players can really hide or mask the fact that they are stepping in because they transact in such huge numbers of shares. With those two concepts in the back of your mind, let's revisit the single candle types that we talked about in our previous lesson. But now let's add in volume as an additional analysis lens. Volume is going to allow you to kind of assign one of these three tags to each of our candle types, right? Bear bull candles, which represent clear directional sentiment, doji candles, which represent indecision, and hammer candles, which represent a potential change in sentiment. But with a volume, we can now either validate that this candle is telling us what we think it's telling us. We can also be potentially suspicious of this candle, or it can be a straight up anomaly, and we can really have alarm bells going off in our head that potentially things are not what they may seem. So we'll start by talking about bear bull candles and how you evaluate them through the lens of volume. With a bear bull candle, remember that this kind of represents just a standard directional move in the marketplace. So you should generally expect the size of these candles and the amount of volume to line up as you would kind of compare it to the average for that stock. So on the left-hand side, let's say you're looking at a five-minute chart of a stock, and the average candle is about as large as this dotted box here. If you see a bullish candle that is, you know, let's say slightly above the average range, and then you see that it has slightly aver above average volume, all you can really tell is that this has been validated, right? 
You don't necessarily need to key in yet or pay closer attention to future price action. You can't predict anything off of this, but you can give this the check mark and say, yeah, this is what I would expect to see. Let's keep watching the chart for anything in the future. Now, when you should get a little bit more suspicious is when you see moves that are close, but not quite perfect in terms of lining up with the averages, right? Let's say maybe you get a, a smaller move on average volume, or you get a larger move on a little bit below average volume. Again, nothing to necessarily be you know, super keyed in on, but this might pique your interest a bit and start to make you slightly more suspicious of what's going to happen in the future. Now, when alarm bells should really be going off is when you see these volume anomalies. Let's say you get a really small candle on huge volume, or you get a really large candle on very small volume. All this should really tell you, again, doesn't say this is what's going to happen next, but it should be setting off alarm bells and you should be hyper-focused on the resulting price action because this is for sure not what should be happening in the marketplace. You moved a huge distance and you put forth almost no effort. So potentially something drastic is going to happen in the next few candles. And really quickly, here are just a few examples of this taking place. So I've highlighted a couple bullish candlesticks up. And you can see that for each of these candles, you had above average volume and you moved generally a, you know, average or above average price range. So you validated each of these moves and as you can see, prices just kind of continued to trend upward. Now on the other side, this is the exact same concept, but downward, right? The move itself in terms of the absolute value of it is all that matters, not whether it was up or down. So if you move down a further distance, you should again be expecting above average volume. And you can see that both on these two candles here as perfect examples, right? You moved a pretty long distance for this stock, but you also had an above average amount of volume. So you'd say those moves are validated. The next candle that we'll talk about are dojis. And remember that dojis represent indecision in the market. They represent kind of this war between buyers and sellers. And so with these, the amount of volume shows the intensity of that struggle. So if you look at the left-hand side here, technically a doji candle is a very small move, right? Or absolutely no move. And so you should expect to see relatively little volume as a result of this candle. So this is kind of the validated instance. You should become more and more suspicious of the candle the higher the volume gets, all the way to the point where you get an anomaly and alarm bells should be going off in your head. So you have this huge volume bar, way above average, on an extremely small price move. Clearly there's a huge fight between buyers and sellers, and the resulting price action could be dramatic. So to show you a few examples of that, I've highlighted two different charts here. The left-hand side is a five-minute chart of SoFi. You saw this chart in the previous lesson, and you see that you've got two below average volume dojis here, right? And over here, you've actually got a couple below average volume dojis. But you can see that the, the resulting price move after these points of indecision, while it is relatively large, is not ultimately that dramatic because you're already kind of in a downtrend and these moves don't really mark necessarily the top or the bottom of a trend. Now, compare that to this chart of NEO, where at the bottom of this fall, you have this huge volume bar on a very small doji candle. The resulting move afterwards is quite dramatic. You get this big rally upwards. And then again, you get these two, what we would call long-legged dojis. And the second one takes place on extremely high volume. Again, the resulting price move afterwards is very dramatic. So it's not that you can necessarily predict which way the price is going to move after these candles take place. It's that when you see these two candles, you should be keyed in to the idea that, okay, something is probably about to happen. There, there's going to be a move after this, and it's likely going to be a much larger move than would normally take place. All right, the last single candle type we'll talk about in relation to volume is the hammer candle. And with hammer candles, I really want you to think back to our first lesson and think about this idea of a potential change in sentiment, right? You would have had a 
pretty strong move in one direction or the other, but the other side, whether it be sellers or buyers, have come in and kind of overwhelmed that to ultimately have the candle finish as a hammer. Now, when it comes to volume pairing with the hammer candle, we kind of just start out at suspicious because low volume hammers, as we'll talk about in future lessons, can actually kind of be traps or test candles that are designed to feel out the retail traders and feel out the market. And so generally you don't want to think, you know, low volume hammer candle, suddenly it's, you know, it's totally good to go, it's validated. You should just, again, generally start at suspicious. And then the higher you go in volume, the more it becomes an anomaly, right? Because it's a very small move and it shows that, you know, either buyers or sellers have stepped in in mass to stop this directional move, right? Now, it's not enough just by itself to take a trade on, right? We'll talk about additional confirmation signals that you need in future lessons, but this is a really good sign on high volume that price is going to reverse at least temporarily. And now again, I'll just share with you a couple examples of this, right? Uh, right here, you see a hammer candle, and it's on just kind of slightly above average volume, directly before a drop, right? So you, you kind of almost looked like you were going to reverse here, right? You're doing a little bit of bottoming action across this support line, and then you shot up, only to then be shoved all the way back down. And that's a point where, you know, again, you can kind of see buyers giving up, and short sellers will start to step in and push the price even lower. And then again, this one would definitely be an anomaly, right? You've got way above average volume on a hammer candle at the bottom of this move. Again, very good sign that price, at least temporarily, will bounce back up. You can see that again on this five minute chart on SoFi. Again, above average volume candle right here, directly before the fall, and then a very large volume candle. And you can see, again, it takes a little bit of time this time to reverse, but again, when you get this super high volume hammer candle, typically price at, you know, at some point will bounce after that. So those are just a few examples. All right, so now that we have covered the single candle types and their volume profiles, we're gonna move back to the four C's of price action that we talked about in our first lesson. And with these different market cycles, they each have a volume profile that you would consider healthy or normal for that period of the market. And any deviation from this volume profile can be just an extremely powerful signal that you're getting stuck and trapped or potentially we're transitioning to one of the other cycles. So with that, we'll go through each of these and essentially, you know, again, validate them through the lens of volume. So we'll start with continuation. And if you remember, continuation is essentially just a trend, right? It's up into the right movement or down into the right movement. Generally respects a moving average, is identified by, you know, in an uptrend, higher highs and lower lows, and in a downtrend, lower lows and lower highs. So really with volume here, all we're trying to do is convince ourselves that either the buyers or the sellers are clearly in charge. And volume really essentially validates for us whether it we're in a healthy uptrend or downtrend, or if we need to potentially be suspicious, you know, for things to maybe move into capitulation or consolidation and eventually reverse. So when you look at a healthy trend, you're really looking for this specific volume pattern right? So the, the candlestick pattern is very obvious, right? You have this, this upward kind of A, B, C, D type movement. But with the volume profile, what you want to see is that new buyers are stepping in to push the trend higher, right? So remember, volume equals effort. So when you see this kind of rising volume pattern with, you know, normal sized candles, kind of candles that are the right size for their volume profile, that means that it's just a healthy trend, right? Buyers are stepping in. Now, when you see a pullback, you should see that there's very little conviction from sellers, 
right? So you get decreasing volume on the pullback. And this is important because this means one, you know, probably short sellers aren't stepping into this move. And then two, the existing buyers are convinced enough that we're going to move higher that they're not selling either, right? And then again, when you start to move back up, you see this stair stepping upward increasing volume. So that's what a healthy trend looks like, right? And if you continue to see this increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing volume profile, then you really have nothing to worry about and no reason to believe, at least from a volume perspective, that the trend's going to reverse. Now, when you want to get suspicious of a trend is when you essentially get a volume profile that doesn't line up with this, right? So to take this example to show kind of an unhealthy trend, you see that you get higher selling right at the top, right? This is kind of your first warning sign in this particular example. So you get this inverted hammer on high volume, which we already talked about on the previous slide is a volume anomaly. And then the second warning sign is that your next push up is on even lower volume, right? And so low, lower volume on the push up shows that there's not very much conviction from the buyers. And then again, at the top, you get a high volume doji, which again, is another volume anomaly. And then kind of the final warning sign in this example is this little spike right at the end on pretty low volume. And that's normally like a test or a trap candle is what it's referred to. So that's an example of a healthy trend and an example of kind of a suspicious anomalous trend. Now I'll show you some real life examples on the next slide. So we'll start by showing some healthy examples of continuation volume. And I want to do that on two different time frames, just to, you know, try to further convince you that this happens on every single time frame that you could be looking at. But first, I've shown a downtrend over here on a one day chart of the square. And you can see that as you have this larger push down, you get increasing volume, right? And then eventually you get a little bit of a pullback and that pullback takes place on very low volume, right? So sellers clearly in control, get a little bit of a resting period. The sellers aren't covering their positions, right? They're staying in, they're convinced that we're gonna continue down and sure enough, we do. So if you look at that on the flip side, on a five minute chart, on an uptrend, you can see again, strong push up on strong volume. And then you get basically no volume on this little pullback right here. And then volume steps in and is slightly above average and pushes you up higher. So those are some examples of a healthy trend, right? If you see this kind of increased volume, decreased volume on the pullback, and you don't have another really good reason to expect that you're going to reverse, then the higher probability play would be a continuation of that existing trend. So now let's look at an unhealthy example of a continuation, right? Where the volume profile should essentially set you off that something's not right and you should potentially be you know, exiting your position or at the very least being ready to exit your position. So let's look at, you know, again, this is an, a one minute chart of NEO. And for the sake of this example, let's pretend that you got in right around here. Okay. Now, if you got in here, you'd see this large uptick candle on big volume. And you'd think, okay, cool, validated. I'm now profitable in this trade. This is a strong move up. Everything makes sense. I'm good to go. But the next three candles, start to make you a little bit suspicious. So you see an inverted hammer on high volume and a doji candle, again, during this pullback on high volume. So you're not getting that strong up, weak volume pullback that you would expect in a healthy uptrend. So if it was me right about here, at the very least, I'd be moving my stop loss to break even, right? I wouldn't be losing money on this trade. And you, you probably honestly would have taken a partial maybe like around here if you were really good. Let's just say you perfectly got it right at the very top. And so you've locked in some profit. You've moved your stop to break even. You then get the second push up. But the second push up, notice, happens on really below average volume right here, right? 
And so this is where alarm bells should start going off, is basically starting at this candle or these two candles. You get a big sell-off, right? So you had a above average doji candle here, right? So alarm bell number one, then alarm bell number two, you get this big sell-off on high volume instead of a low volume pullback. And then again, this this final, like where I basically would have exited my position was seeing essentially, you know, very little volume on this push back up. And right about here, that's when I would start to think, okay, I, I probably need to get, just take the rest off. There's obviously a ton of other signals that you could use, but that's that's where I would start to be very suspicious. And again, you can see the result of this is you actually get kind of this double top pattern here and then a move back down. So that's how you would kind of step through and assess a trend and start to have some warning signs and alarm bells going off in your head. So now we're gonna move on to the second C in the four C's of price action, and that's consolidation. If you remember back to our first lesson, we said that consolidation ranges form uh, for a couple of key reasons. Either you know the market is generally in indecision, right? Maybe you're prior to earnings or pending some big news announcement from the Fed, or you have a big player or a set of big players accumulating and distributing shares before igniting a trend in a new direction. So because of this, we're gonna actually have three different volume profiles that you have to pay attention to for ranges. Right, and so it's not that you are, you know, suspicious necessarily of a range, or that a particular range is an anomaly, but you're trying to identify which of these phases you're actually in. Right? Are you in accumulation? Are you in distribution? Or are you just in this chop phase, this indecision phase in the market? All right. So let's start by talking about accumulation, and with accumulation. You know, what I really want you to take away is that there are large, large players out in the stock market, right? We are tiny, tiny, infinitesimally small fish in a massive ocean when it, you know, when we compare to hedge funds, right? We might take 500 shares of a stock where they're trying to accumulate a position that is several million shares. And when you're trying to accumulate that many shares, you can't do it in one fell swoop, right? They're going to move the stock price too far and their average entry price is going to be worse, right? But they have the buying power to actually hold the price in a specific range so that their average entry price can be, you know, essentially what they are targeting. So with an accumulation range, what you should see is you should see higher volume towards the downside, right? Because they're trying to get in, say, at, at this price down here, but they have to hold the price within this general range. So let's say maybe their, their average entry price can be closer to this, right? It's not gonna be perfectly the bottom of the range, but they're gonna accumulate significantly more shares here, and then they're actually gonna sell just enough to essentially force price back down into this range so they can then accumulate even more at the, the bottom end, right? Now, with distribution, this is exactly the opposite case of accumulation, right? It's a large player that doesn't want to kick off a panic selling instance, right? They can't just go dump 10 million shares in the market in one order. And so they have to hold price in this range while they sell towards the top end of the range here, right? And they buy back up just enough to keep us, again, within this general range so that their, their average entry price or exit price, rather, in this case, you know, is closer to the top end of the range. Now, finally, with this kind of neutral indecision chop range, you have no clear signal whether or not there's more volume on the top side or on the bottom side of your range. And this, honestly, this entire situation, you just want to stay away from as much as possible in the marketplace because you're just going to get chopped up. You're going to, you know, Again, you're gonna enter here thinking we're gonna break out and then it's gonna immediately go back down. And then you're gonna short down here because you think we're gonna break down out of this range, but then you're gonna immediately get stopped out here. So again, if you see this and you see just average 
flatlining volume across, stay away from it as much as possible. So with that, we'll get into a couple examples of consolidation. Before we get into these specific examples, I want to just introduce a concept or a new indicator that you can use to help identify whether or not a range is a distribution range or an accumulation range. And this is a study called volume by price. So down here at the bottom of our chart, we have volume by time, right? But on the left-hand side of our chart, when you add this study, you'll get this histogram that essentially shows you how much, how many shares, right? How much volume has gone through at each individual price. And you will get this dark blue line, or however you set it up, you'll get this dark line that's called VPOC, which stands for Volume Point of Control. And this is the single price at which the most shares have transacted over the total time frame that you currently have visible on your chart, right? And so you can see with this example of distribution, you go into this sideways chop range on this one minute chart of NEO. And your volume point of control, right, the point at which the most shares have been transacted, is actually at the top end of your range, right? And so you can be pretty confident that this is a distribution range. And you could tell this through individual candles as well, right? Like this candle, you could have seen it form and most of the volume would have been at the top end. This one, again, you get this fairly average volume doji at the top. Another one here where, you know, again, probably all this volume came in like right at the last second of the candle. And so you can tell this, but this indicator here just makes it a little bit more obvious. So you can see, again, distribution, top end of the range. Over here, you have a one day chart. Again, these work on all different time frames, And you can see that Netflix has been in this general choppy range here. And your VPOC, your volume point of control, is all the way at the bottom of this range. So this would have been a really good way to tell that, hey, you know, potentially a large player is accumulating here or the market is getting ready to reverse. So those are some examples of accumulation and distribution. So of course, we'll include one example of the third consolidation uh, scenario, which is indecision, right? And I said that that typically happens prior to earnings calls. Here's a perfect example of that. This is Snapchat. You can see that they have an earnings call uh, after market hours on this day. And for the several hours leading into the close of the market, you essentially just get chop, flatlined volume, volume point of control that's just dead center in the middle of this range, right? And nobody is really willing to make a heavy decision one direction or the other because they're trying to wait for that earnings call announcement to see, you know, hey, do I need to bail on this stock or, you know, maybe it's maybe it's a buy now. So there's an example. And again, you can see that after that earnings announcement came out, it was bad news and Snapchat dropped significantly. But you would not want to be trading in this chop prior to that happening. All right, so we're going to move on to the third C of price action, which is constriction. And with constriction, I have broken it out into both triangles and wedges. And I want to just start off by saying that, in my opinion, constriction is the hardest to read overall and the hardest to tell kind of like which direction it's going to break out of this constriction range. I've started with triangles because, I, again, I think they're easier to read than wedges, which I mentioned in the previous lesson. But with these, the general idea, right, is that you have some resistance line at the top, right? And participants are trying to break through this line. And so each time they fail to break through, price pulls back less. So you get this essentially ascending, this is what's called an ascending triangle. So when you're looking at volume on triangles, what you want to see is overall declining volume because fewer and fewer people are making decisions as you get closer to this constriction kind of final triangle tip. And on top of overall declining volume, you want to see heavier volume as you attempt to break through, right? Ultimately having an extremely high volume break of this resistance level. And that's what a healthy triangle looks like, right? Because they're trying to break through. And then essentially this is an uptrend, right? So you get lower volume on the pullback because buyers are convinced that we will eventually break this level. 
another wave of buyers trying to break it, resting volume, because again, these buyers are still convinced this is going to break. And then finally, a huge wave of buyers coming in, potentially shorts covering, potentially people pulling orders here or the orders getting filled completely. And then you get a bust through of this resistance line. Now, there are two situations where you should kind of be suspicious. The first is that you have just generally elevated volume across the board and particularly elevated volume when you're pulling back away from this line, right? This can be a sign that, you know, potentially a large short seller is coming in, buyers are giving up. You know, either way, again, this is generally an uptrend. So seeing large volume on the, the pullback here is generally a bad sign. And then where you should really be suspicious is if you have a very low volume break of this area. That is consistently a very obvious trap, and this happens a lot with triangles, um, particularly when you're just in a bearish market, let's say, and you're sending triangle. It can, it can be kind of a trap to capture a few more stops, a few more people that thought we were going to go long just to take it and reverse it back short. And then the second thing that you should be suspicious of is just generally low volume across the move, right? This shows a lack of conviction and again, a constriction, it should be a loading spring, right? So there should be more tension and more volume equals more tension. So those are the two you should be suspicious of and an example of a healthy one. And then we'll go on into some live, you know, real life examples next. Okay, so on to the live examples. I've, again, shown this on two different time frames. I'm just going to keep on hammering this home. That this works on every single time frame. Um, but here's an upward ascending triangle of Piton. And again, like I said, these are not quite as clear and not quite as easy to read. But you can clearly see that price is closing above this line on the bottom every time. So we're pulling back less and less far each and every time. And then you're trying to break through this upper resistance. Um, again, generally speaking, volume is closer, as you can see by this VPOC line, to the top end of the range. And then when you do break, you get extremely high volume, right? So that's an example of a healthy normal triangle. And here's an example on a one minute chart of Ford. All right, so upper end of the range with this VPOC, generally within this kind of upward ascending triangle, and then extremely high volume when you do eventually break through. And then here is a suspicious triangle. Again, remember what I said, you know, you're running into a significant resistance level. And on this example, you can just see elevated volume across the board, right? So if this was kind of normal average volume prior to the triangle forming, you know, you can see that this average line, this little black line here is clearly moving upwards throughout this entire triangle. And you know, again, you do have volume closer to the top end of the range, so you could be forgiven if you thought this was a fairly difficult one to read up until this point, but where you should really be, you know, having alarm bells going off and being very suspicious is look at this breakthrough, right? It's barely any higher than these previous candles, right? And then on top of that, not only is it, you know, lower volume, but it fails to hold that breakout range and then forms an inverted hammer, right? And then you can see this fails and you, you could have taken a short all the way back down. So that's an unhealthy or suspicious triangle. The second part of constriction that we'll talk about is wedges. And with wedges, I want to start by saying these are definitely harder than triangles to read and generally are just one of the harder patterns um, to use to be able to tell, you know, which direction it's going to break. It's more often than not kind of more of an indecision pattern. And as an indecision pattern, you will generally see the highest level of volume just dead center in the middle of the wedge. Now, there are other tools that we'll go through in the future, such as having a level two on your system or using a, a tool like Bookmap, and these can help you determine which direction it's going to break. But in general, keep in mind, you know, it is an indecision pattern. If you're going to have a bias just based on the pattern, it should generally be in the direction of the current trend on like the higher time frame. And then the last thing I want to say about this is really that there is no quote unquote healthy wedge, right? Just like the hammer candle, 
you should kind of just start by being suspicious of this pattern in general. Um, and again, try to use other tools that we'll discuss in the future to determine a directional bias after that. So here are two examples of constriction wedges. And these are pretty you know, textbook examples, both of them happening on different time frames. And this one is a five minute chart. So you can see the volume point of control is dead center in the middle of this wedge. And then again, you, know, you do get above average volume when it does eventually break out. And then on the um, weekly chart here of American Airlines, you can see, again, this long-term wedge has been forming. You've got VPOC pretty much right in the middle, and then you get large volume when it does eventually break out. So those are two examples. Again, be suspicious of this pattern. Use other tools, which we'll discuss in the future, to determine a directional bias. But generally keep in mind, the market is constricting, the spring is loading, and there will be probably a you know, large move in one direction or the other. And that brings us to capitulation, which is the four C in our four C's of price action. I'm again gonna talk about this one in two parts, and we'll start by discussing the double top and double bottom pattern, and then we'll talk about the head and shoulder pattern second. So remember with capitulation that, you know, it generally represents this kind of last gasp, right, at the top or the bottom of a trend. And so as such, you know, you should, uh, you know, have significantly higher volume as both sides go to war and one side eventually wins. And so we often refer to this huge volume event at the top or bottom of a trend as climactic volume. So when you're validating a reversal, a true double top reversal will generally show pretty climactic selling pressure at the top. So especially in this first push up, the first top and the double top, you will see very high volume, generally on a narrow range candle. On the second push up, you'll see very weak volume pushing up and then higher volume stepping in as shorts come in and buyers give up. And so that'll kind of represent the failure and a trend will start in the opposite direction. Now, when you wanna be careful, right, suspicious, is when you kind of mistake a simple pullback in trend as a double top. And I'll show you some examples of that on the following slides, right? But if volume is strong, but not anomalous, and then you have decreasing volume on this pullback, you could very well be baited into thinking this is a double top, only to have it be a continuation pattern, and then spike up on high volume and stop you out. So be very careful of reversals if they don't have this specific volume profile that we're covering. And so here are some validated reversal examples, right, that, that show this volume profile that we should expect. Here's a daily chart, and you can see that on this first push up, you get extremely climactic volume, then weaker volume on the second push up, resulting in very high volume here at the second top, and then you get a failure and a reversal of trend back down. You can see this again on a one minute chart, happens on all time frames. And you can see very climactic volume down here into this first bottom and then a low volume retest and increase in volume as you push back out of this in a reverse and trend. So happens on all time frames. Those are some examples of a quote unquote validated reversal. Now here's an example of what you don't want to get caught in, right? And how this volume profile can keep you from getting trapped in a false move, right? So let's just say you're sitting here watching QQQ and you've been waiting all day for it to do a reversal, right? You think it's reached its top. You see this inverted hammer form. And so you think, oh good, okay, there's my first top potentially. Now let's wait for the second top. Pushes back up into the second top forms this weak hammer, and then starts to fail back down. And if you weren't paying attention to the volume profile, you, you might have been fooled by this move. You might short here thinking, okay, we're gonna reverse. But if you paid attention, you could see that this first top was on just 
basically below average volume, right? You did get a weak second push, but overall this entire section is kind of just this declining volume consolidation, right? It's, it's this pause in trend and clearly we were gonna basically continue to push higher. There was no reason to think that this was weak or that this was you know, forming a double top. So please use the volume profile to keep yourself from getting trapped in these reversals. This is, I think, for the people that trade reversals, one of the things that catches them out the most, especially at the beginning of their trading career, is they'll just keep shorting over and over again every time something looks even a little bit like a double top because that's the pattern. It's a reversal pattern. It's a climactic pattern. But if it doesn't come along with the climactic volume, then shorting it is gonna be a very low probability play. And so we'll end capitulation by talking about the head and shoulders pattern. Remember that the important price action takeaway, right, the psychological takeaway, is that we've hit this area of resistance, broken through it, failed to push higher, retested it, right, and then failed lower. And again, you can reverse that if it's a head and shoulders pattern on the, on the downside. So if you remember volume equals effort, we were looking for this kind of climactic push, volume should be much more elevated as it attempts to break through the initial level and bordering on climactic at the very top. Now, I will say that climactic volume, like truly climactic volume, is rarer on a head and shoulders pattern. And that's generally because this pattern is, is spread over a larger period of time. So with a validated head and shoulders pattern, again, elevated volume on this first push, climactic-ish volume on the middle push, and then weak volume retest, and then elevated volume as you fail back out. And if you don't see that, then this could just be a very complex pullback in a larger trend, and then you're gonna get stopped out as you push higher. So again, if you just see generally lower volume across the board, right, or volume that is more in line with a pullback and trend, you need to be careful and not get trapped in that move. And so again, real fast, I'll provide you with some validated examples before we start talking about support and resistance. So here you can see on this one minute chart of NVIDIA, you get a high volume inverted hammer right before you break through, then elevated volume as you break through, and a very weak retest on this second shoulder and then a failure. This is it on a one day chart of DraftKings and you can see elevated volume as you're trying to break through this first resistance point, elevated volume as you push into this second point, and then a very, very weak retest, very low volume on these candles retesting on the second shoulder and then a failure back down. And that is the head and shoulders pattern. So the last thing I wanna do in this lesson is just quickly revisit support and resistance, but this time kind of fully cover the fourth concept that we didn't discuss in the first lesson. And this is the concept that the strength of a support or a resistance level is really a function of volume and time. So levels that are closer in time, right, say like within the last week or within the last month, are generally stronger than those that are years back. And then also, the more volume that has been transacted at that level, the stronger it is going to be. So that's the fourth concept, and I'm gonna walk you through some examples of that in more detail now. All right, so to highlight the last concept of support and resistance, I've chosen an example from Facebook because I think it's just kind of a perfect example of this concept. Now, Facebook, you know, forgive this old chart, they currently trade under the ticker Meta, but again, I still think this is just a perfect example to highlight this concept. So we said that levels that are closer in time, right, and transact at higher volume are stronger, right? They have more pull towards them and they have more you know, push in terms of resistance than those that are further out in the past. So in this example, the previous low of day for Facebook is basically where the stock closed for that day. Okay, so this is a five minute chart and the volume bar is pretty clearly demarcate the beginning and ending of the day. And so you have extremely high volume at the bottom, right here and right here, right at the close of the day. And that sets VPOC, the volume point of control, 
basically at the 225-ish area, okay? So overnight, Facebook sells off, and you can see that when the market opened, right, you, you're basically gapping down, and then when the market opened, you get a retest of that volume point of control around 225 from the previous day, right? It tests previous day close, which is this dashed black line, and then proceeds to fail and sell off for the entire rest of the day, right? So that very recent level of previous day close where a ton of volume was transacted served as an extremely valuable resistance line that you could have played fairly easily for a short and then just had it trend basically all the way back down throughout the entire rest of the day. So that's just one example. Obviously, there's tons of examples out there, and that's a very common thing that you can use. But I wanted to you know, quickly highlight that when you're considering levels to use as support and resistance, one of the easiest go-tos for a lot of traders is just previous daily highs and lows, and then the previous day close price. And that brings us to the end of our second lesson. Thanks so much for watching all the way through to the end. I know this one was a little bit longer, but hopefully you found it helpful. And I just want to leave you with two quick comments before we sign out. First is that you need to be combining our price action analysis lesson with the volume analysis lesson, right? The combination of these two techniques is what is truly powerful and will help you interpret what is happening in the market auction. Second, if you take nothing else away from this video, remember the concept that volume equals effort and that all of your future price action analysis should be viewed through this lens, right? Volume should be what is validating or invalidating what you're seeing in the market. Finally, if you like the video, please leave it with a thumbs up. If you have any questions that you don't feel like I covered, please leave a comment and I'll absolutely respond to it. And then finally, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel for more content in the future. Thanks so much for watching guys. Have a great day.